Welcome to the John Dickinson Plantation. This is the boyhood home of John Dickinson, one of Delaware signers of the U.S. Constitution. In addition to signing the Constitution, uh, John is governor, or then called president, of the state of Delaware, as well as the state of Pennsylvania. In his adult life, he has three homes. He has the house here in uh, Jones Neck in Kent County, Delaware. He has a house in Wilmington and also in Philadelphia. But this is the only house that survives today. This is the front of the house. And a lot of times we get confusion on what's the front and what's the rear. And the reason why this is the front is the house is actually overlooking the St. Jones River. Uh, which today you don't see a lot of water from the front of the house here. You see a lot of marsh and that's what's happened to the St. Jones. It's silted in on itself. Like I said, become marshy. It looks nothing like it did when the house was built in 1740. But in the plantation's heyday, that is the major shipping route out of here. Uh, this, they exported mostly corn and wheat. Everything would be placed on boats down at the river and they would be ship, uh, sail up the river and out into the Delaware Bay and from there they would go north to places like Wilmington and Philadelphia where they would sell their corn and their wheat that they grew out here. Now in the entranceway here there's two things that are kind of important. One I always talk about when we walk in the size of the front door and the back doors is good size as well and that's actually set up for cross ventilation. Um, if you open these two doors, you do catch a nice breeze through here, and it helps to keep the house cool. Also in here, you do see Cato, who was a slave owned by the family, but then later freed by the family because they were Quakers, and the Dickinson sticking with Quaker faith freed their, um, their slaves. But what's interesting about Cato is a lot of times we'll get guests out here, and they'll say, boy, he's extremely well-dressed for a slave. And the reason why Cato is so formally dressed is his major job or his major role was he was John's manservant. So wherever John was, Cato was not far off, and that's why he's shown as formally dressed as he is right there. Now we're in the parlor of the house. Um, it's where you would have done your entertaining. It's where you would have displayed your nicest things. You're, of course, greeted by Mr. Dickinson when you walk in here. And some of the other things I like to point out in this room are we have his brother's china in the china closets, or bow fats as they called them. The desk over here actually belonged to Caesar Rodney. And what a lot of people don't realize is that just across the road here, what, what's Kitts Hummock Road today, um, but that property over there, and some of which is air-based property today, uh, was the Rodney Plantation. And that house is gone. It hasn't survived like this one has. Now this is the uh, study or the book room of the plantation. This is actually my favorite room in the house. Um, I'm standing next to the portrait of Samuel here, and Samuel is John's father, and as we talked about him moving here from Talbot County, Maryland, when John was a young boy, he's the one responsible for this house being built <clears throat> and the family making the move, and he's buried out here along our pathway up to the plantation in a little, little bricked-in enclosure out here, and he died here in 1760. Um, to the right of that, that is the Society of Cincinnati Certificate, which was an organization of men that led troops in the Revolution. And, that's very faded, and that's why we keep it kind of tucked back there in the corner, but that is signed by Washington, and it's neat that we have that document. The descendants of the original members have actually kept that society going today, and they still have a building in Washington. This is the parlor chamber. Um, when we get our school field trips here, I always tell kids this would probably be the, what we call the master bedroom today, but back in colonial times, they would have called it the parlor chamber. Um, several things of note in here I like to point out. Um, the bedding, a lot of times we get questioned on why the bed is kind of round and lumpy like that. That is the ticking that they would sleep on, which would have been stuffed full of either straw or feathers, kind of like our mattresses of today. Also behind us here, uh, we have the mannequin of Violet, who was another slave owned by the family and later freed by the family. And she's in there next to the cradle. And her major kind of duty or her major job was childcare. Thankfully, John's oldest daughter was kind of a little bit of a history buff. And she sat down with Violet in her later years. Violet lived to be quite old. And they have basically straight out of Violet's, you know, word for word, or straight out of her mouth, what this place was like when John was a young boy. So we're able to interpret this place very accurately thanks to not only the documents that we have from John, but also the documents that we have from the tenants that were out here and also some of the recollections of the slaves that were out here. One thing I like to talk about in this bed chamber on the second floor here is the bedding. And today we would probably call this bed a Murphy bed because the legs fold up. You could take your ticking off of it that would have been filled with your straw or feathers. And like I said, the bed folds up and out of the way here so you could kind of have more space to use the room for the day. This is your uh, kitchen in the house. And the kitchens in houses like this only would have been used during your extreme winter months. Typically houses like this, and this one did, had a detached summer kitchen away from the house because they were so worried about fire. A lot of times uh, people think we have a couple hearths down here in the basement. This is the only actual functioning hearth behind us. Across the way here, that's nothing more than a support for all those fireplaces above through the house. 
Now where we are now is this is where we've kind of transitioned from the original section of the house. We come into 1793. This is the dining room that John adds. His father had actually already added a smaller one onto the house before this. John, after he's gone, John knocks it down, builds this one um, in 1793. A couple of the features that I like to point out in here. Um, one, you see the color green. This was extremely expensive to make. So this is kind of a, another subtle way for the Dickinsons to kind of show off a little bit that if you all are guests coming into the dining room and you see this, you knew they could afford it. You see the 10 plate stove. Um, and I always tell people, this is kind of like technology as the house is, is evolving. Because they realize in that 1740 section how much firewood it's taken to heat a house through the winter. These are a lot more kind of energy efficient, I guess you could say, for the time. They use less wood. It makes it a lot easier to heat this portion. So this is kind of like technology as the house is evolving here. What you see as far as the outbuildings are reproductions, but they're built off of um, buildings that would have been here or very similar to that in, in John's time out here. Um, in the plantation's heyday, there's numerous, numerous outbuildings. And what we have around us today is just kind of a sample to show you buildings that would have been out here. We have a replica log dwelling, uh, smokehouse, a stable, corn crib, granary. Um, the other building that's not really a period building on site, but uh, as you enter the plantation, we have a visitor center um, that we show people a little film in. And of course, we have our modern conveniences like restrooms and things like that for our visitors. John actually, when he dies, he has the two children. Um, he, he actually has five children, but only the first and the fifth live. And the oldest daughter, Sally, never marries, never has children. The youngest daughter, Mariah, marries into the Logan family from Philadelphia, the big, well-known Logans from Philadelphia. And for years and years and years, that's who owns this property, are the descendants of Mariah. They don't so much live here as they do basically tenant it out. It's a tenant farm for people, you know, working the grounds. Um, it stays a tenant farm up until the early of uh, 1950s, and I believe the state gets the property in 1952. There's about four years of work put into it, and it's open as a museum in 1956.